In this next video from War, Art and Visual Culture Sydney, Dr Sarah Menslow from Cal State chairs this session with Emily Shoyer from NYU and Niall McMahon from Curtin University. I hope you enjoy this video. Um, this is Niall McMahon um, from Curtin University presenting Invisible Targets, My Way and the Impact of Conflict on South Korean War Cinema. Yeah, you have to apologize everyone as well. The abstracts when we were at the conference are slightly outdated. So <laughs> if things don't line up, that's fine. Okay? Yeah. So for the entirety of the 20th century, the Korean Peninsula has endured near continuous conflict. Starting with the Japanese occupation of Korea in 1910, the division of Korea into the southern and northern sovereign nations in 1948, the subsequent Korean War in 1950 and the massacre and false imprisonment of South Korean citizens by their government during the 1980s. In Korea, this period is marked by oppression and tragedy on both an international and domestic scale. As long as Korea has had filmmaking capabilities, war and conflict has been intrinsic to the nation and consequently inherent to their historical films. No other geopolitical conflict has been widely misrepresented by the historical films of the international community than World War II with countries including the United States, France, Germany, Australia, and Japan, each creating films that depict the specific conflict. However, despite the inherency of warfare in the South Korean historical film and World War II's prominence in international cinema, there has curiously been a dearth of South Korean World War II films. Roughly only a dozen South Korean historical films are set during the World War II period, with only one, the 2011 film My Way, containing depictions of Korean soldiers engaging in armed combat during the war. The film follows Korean Kim Jong-shik and Japanese Hagasawa Tatsuo as they fight alongside numerous infantry forces during World War II, including Russia, Japan, and Germany, as they search for a way back to Korea. My Way contains three key battle sequences which pit two different infantry forces against each other. A tank battle in Mongolia, a charge of a machine gun nest in Russia, and a defense of a German bunker in Normandy on Dika. Okay. These battle sequences are comparable to other notable World War II films, such as the French film Days of Glory and the Russian film Fortress of War, in regards to how each formally constructs the depictions of warfare. However, one significant difference between battle sequences of My Way, Days of Glory, and Fortress of War is that the battles of the latter two contain obvious objectives for the infantry to complete, whereas the former does not. According to the United States Army's nine principles of war, every military operation is required to progress towards a clearly defined, decisive, and obtainable objective, with the purpose of the destruction of the enemy's armed forces and will to fight. Essentially, every battle involves the infantry progressing towards the goal, such as the demolition of key buildings or items and the assassination of key targets, the completion of which will be a significant outcome for the nation's war efforts. The analysis of My Way's battle sequences to key battles from days of glory and forces of war reveals that the presence or absence of objectives during battle has a clear influence on the cinematography, editing, and mise en scene of each sequence, specifically in regards to how geography and death have been formed and constructed. Furthermore, the analysis of these objectives can act as a catalyst to reveal not only how World War II has been depicted in South Korean historical film, but also why there has been a lack of representation of World War II within this national cinema. So shots that reveal the geography of the battle sequence are important to establish the terrain and layout of the battlefield, where one army is in relation to the other, and when movement occurs, where the soldiers are relocated. So the presence of objectives in Days of Glory's mountain assaults, which the present the protagonist French infantry advancing up steep mountain terrain to destroy German machine guns, and Fortress of War's tank defense, which depicts the protagonist Russian infantry defending their barracks from an advancing German tank unit, informs how these shots of geography are formed and constructed, specifically in how each sequence's geography is utilized to establish what the objectives of each battle are. So the cinematography of Days of Glory's mountain assault depicts the size and harsh terrain of the mountain in numerous white shots, placing the French at the bottom of the mountain at the beginning of the battle, with the Germans at the top. In subsequent white shots, the French run up to incline towards the mountain's peak, with shots of geography indicating that the skirmish is ascendant towards the German machine guns. Therefore, the sequence's formal construction of geography implies that the objective of the battle is to reach the peak of the mountain, destroying all enemy infantry during the climb. In Fortress of War's tank defense, the formal construction of geography indicates the sequence's objective, the destruction of a key enemy position, 
as the start of the sequence, the cinematography and mise en scène establishes the three main elements of the battle and their relative positions. The Russian infantry in front of their barracks, an anti-tank gun to their right, and the German tanks directly in front of them. The Russian infantry and anti-tank gun were mostly stationary during the battle, with the German tanks being the only element that moves. As a result, the tanks form the sequence's central landmark, with their relative positions of the Russian infantry always known. Therefore, the shells of geography establish the tanks as the primary focus of the battlefield, wordlessly establishing their destruction as the battle's objective. The formal construction of geography in my way's battle sequences, however, do not establish an objective. Each battle phase of cinematography that has primary close-ups and mid-shots of protagonist infantry, which refers to the army that Tatsuo and John Schick are a part of during the battle, not allowing for any geographical awareness to be established. Furthermore, the cinematography is often handheld, with each shot lasting for less than a second, cutting between Tatsuo, John Schick, and anonymous protagonist soldiers seemingly at random. Consequently, the spatial orientation of protagonists to each other and the battlefield is kept vague, as no central landmark or sense of direction can be established in geography. Additionally, no matter how far the protagonists run in any direction, they always appear to remain an equal distance away from the front lines of the first infantry. As a result, it is unclear how close the protagonist's infantry are to the enemy lines, and vice versa, keeping the battle at equilibrium until the sequence concludes with a fade to black. Now, this ambiguity is notable during a battle that takes place in Russia, in which the Russian prisoners of war, the scene's protagonist's infantry, are forced to charge across a destroyed city towards a heavily fortified enemy position. Despite numerous shots of geography, through the use of an extreme wide shot, John Sheik and Tatsuo always appear at the center of the battlefield no matter how far they come from the retreat. Therefore, unlike Days of Glory and Fortress of War, my way's formal construction of geography does not establish an objective, instead seemingly stranding the infantry in the middle of the battlefield, unable to progress. Now, death has three distinct ways of being formally constructed in the battle sequence. The shot reverse shot killing, the shooter within the same shot killing, and an implied off-screen shooter film. So in each film, the formal construction of death, as well as the amount of death that occurs, is significant. So evidently, in Days of Glory and Fortress of War, the most deaths are caused by whichever infantry force has the most shots of direct combat, which refers to any shot of visible sword strikes, explosions, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and gunfire from rifles or artillery. So that would be the enemy infantry in Days of Glory, and the protagonist infantry in Fortress of War. So in Days of Glory, within the 149 shots in total in which they are present, the protagonist infantry only cause three on-screen enemy deaths. Significantly, however, of the 25 protagonist deaths, 15 occur via a shot reverse shot, and 10 via an implied off-screen shooter. As a result, due to the large instance of off-screen shooters, the enemy force appears greater than what is shown, being granted overwhelming numbers through implication rather than visibility. Conversely, protagonists are contextualized to be a less effective fighting force than the enemy, placing them at a disadvantage for their entire push up the mountain. As every death occurs during this advance, each demise signifies a progression towards the completion of the sequence's objective, resulting in a victory that is well earned, and most importantly, worth the sacrifice of the dead. Conversely, in Fortress of War, six of the enemy deaths are via a shot reverse shot, 19 via a shooter within the same shot, and nine via an implied off-screen shooter. However, the four protagonist deaths are via two shot reverse shots and two shooters within the same shot, respectively. Yet the protagonist deaths occur prior to the demolition of the German tanks. The majority of the enemy deaths occur during the hand to hand combat after their destruction. So before the completion of the objective, the enemy is more lethal than the protagonists, but after the objective has been completed, this dynamic is inverted. Who holds the power in the sequence hinges first on the pursuit and then the completion of the objective. So consequently, in both Days of Glory and Fortress of War, the presence of an objective influences how death is formally constructed, specifically by establishing the power dynamics of each infantry force and granting the deaths of the protagonist soldiers meaning within the conflict. In the battle sequences of my way, however, the ratio of screen presence of an infantry force to the deaths that cause is inconsistent. In the film's three key battle sequences, the enemy infantry always has less shots of direct combat than the protagonists, but are always the most lethal. This pattern continues in the film's other battle sequences, indicating that the more the protagonists are shown, the less effective they are. At all times, the enemy force is superior to protagonists, furthered by the majority of protagonist deaths occurring by the of screen shooting. 
So these off-screen shooters make the enemy appear omniscient, with their bullets and explosions coming from all directions. Consequently, this ordinance is attributed to the entire enemy force and rarely accredited to an individual. Conversely, the majority of the enemy deaths are shown by a shooter with the same shot, in turn assigning every kill to a specific protagonist soldier. The implication being that the rest of the protagonist's infantry are missing their shots. So similar to Days of Glory and Fortress of War, these deaths establish the power dynamic of the imposing military forces. However, in my way, the advantage is always in favor of the enemy. The protagonists are constantly overwhelmed, with no chance to end the battle through combat alone. Additionally, due to the absence of objectives in battle, the deaths of the protagonist's infantry are not given purpose. All the protagonist's deaths contained in the mountain salt and tank defense are contextualized in the progression towards the completion of the objective. In my way, these deaths are in the pursuit of nothing. Therefore, through the absence of an objective, the formal construction of deaths in my way's battle sequences make each of the grounds of slaughter with victory incapable of being contained. So while the absence of objectives in my way could initially appear innocuous, when the film is placed in the context of the social cultural climate of Korea during World War II, this absence becomes significant. So during World War II, Korea was under Japanese occupation. Following Japan's annexation of Korea in 1910, the Japanese banned the Korean language for public use and publications, altered Korean education under a Japanese framework, and forced the Korean people to not only learn the Japanese language, but to adopt Japanese names. Between 1939 and 1945, however, the harsh treatment of the Koreans by the Japanese intensified, with Korean men being forcibly conscripted in the Japanese army, and the women being coerced into sexual slavery. While well, Days of Glory depicts French colonial soldiers fighting on the side of France, and Fortress of War depicts Russian soldiers fighting to protect Russia, my way depicts Korean soldiers fighting on the side of a nation that actively oppressed them, with their participation in combat and furthering their subjugation. Therefore, when placed into this historical context of Korea during the World War II, the absence of objectives in my way's battle sequences can be argued twofold to avoid glorifying Japan, and to embody the Korean cultural concept of harm within the film's construction. So the first argument, the avoidance of glorifying Japan, ties directly into the objectives of the battle sequence and what they may represent to the characters and nations depicted. In the mountain assault and tank defense of Fortress of War and Days of Glory, the completion of an objective denoted victory and signified a clear point where combat could cease. Furthermore, in these battles, victory is represented as a positive outcome, with the protagonist celebrating through either physical or verbal action, such as cheering, hugging, and smiling. However, without an objective, there is no victory to the game of the battle sequence of the fight. The Korean soldiers achieve nothing, and the war continues indefinitely at the discretion of those who oppress them. As the Korean soldiers were forced to be conscripted as a conflict by Japan during the war, historically, Koreans were never fighting for their own interests throughout a sense of national pride, but only to further Japan's goals during the war. Therefore, it is possible to argue that in the South Korean World War II film, any victory in battle replaced this conquest under a context of the Japanese triumph. So in my way, this does not only include the Mongolia battle, the only battle in which Junshi and Tatsui fight in the Japanese army, but any battle in which these characters are present. So while the Russia and Normandy battle sequences do not involve the Japanese army, with the main characters fighting on the side of Russia and Germany respectively, Rewarding Junshik and Tatsuo's prowess in battle as triumph would venerate the training of the of Japanese infantry. So therefore, the depiction of Koreans completing an objective would shape the Japanese occupation of Korea, the forced conscription of Korean men, and sexual slavery of Korean women under a positive lens, no matter how momentary or insignificant the victory is to the Japanese army. To remove the objectives is to remove this positive lens. Under a Korean context, the actions of the Japanese remain condemned. So the second argument that may explain the absence of objectives within my way's battle sequences is the embodiment of the Korean cultural concept of Han within the film's form construction. So Han is a complex and multifaceted concept that is believed to be felt by all Koreans, regardless of age, gender, or social status. The term describes the collective anger, sorrow, and grief at the injustices each Korean suffers in their own lives in relation to their government, employees, families, and friends. However, another fundamental aspect of Han is its inherent hope specifically to silently endure hardship and suffering. Therefore, alongside Han's anger, sorrow, and grief, the resilience of the Korean people is emphasized in the hope that a nation may endure hardship without being destroyed. Believed to originate from the oppression of the Korean people during the Japanese occupation, Han has since been deemed the soul of Korean arts, literature, and film. 
happening throughout all of Korean artwork, regardless of its normal construction and production contexts. So when Han is analysed within South Korean cinema, specifically those whose narrative involved violent action and the fight to free oneself from the oppression of others, the cultural concept manifests as an inability to achieve catharsis, leaving the pursuit of freedom unresolved. So characters do not always receive absolution through their quests, they are often killed in their single-minded pursuit, leaving their goal incomplete or unaccomplished. Not only does the lack of battlefield objectives in my embody this inability to achieve catharsis, this absence also embodies the hope of Han, specifically through Janshi and Tasso's resilience of combat. So without the central objective, all three of my way's battle sequences appear aimless and chaotic, with their formal destruction routinely stranding Junshi and Tasso at the center of each battle, surrounded by meaningless deaths and countless explosions and gunfire caused by an enemy that is always superior to them. So when each battle is viewed under the lens of Han, Janshi and Tasso's inability to overcome the enemy through their prowess in battle is reflective of their incapability to escape the oppressors and gain their freedom. Additionally, each battle ends with the nation Junshi and Tatsu fighting alongside Luzin, with the scene fading in the black before the battle has definitively concluded. Therefore, their inability to kill the enemy soldiers, along with repeated losses, is also a failure to achieve catharsis by overcoming the persecution. At no point during My Way's battle sequences of Junshi and Tatsu are able to restore the balance of justice in their favour, and as a result, their experiences on the battlefield is reflective of the current part. Additionally, the absence of objectives also reflects the hope of Han, with Junshi and Tatsu's ability to endure battle being reflected in the Korean resilience under oppression or invasion. As both characters are stranded without purpose at the center of battle, all the characters can do is survive, waiting for the combat to end by external forces. As the battle does not have an objective, this conclusion can only brought, be brought about through means that does not involve Junshi and Tatsu's participation. Therefore, the ability of the film's central characters to endure battle and live to fight another day is reminiscent of Han's own hope. Consequently, the absence of objectives intertwines South Korean cinema's representation of World War II with a cultural concept that simultaneously dwells upon the nation's historical oppression whilst also celebrating their resilience. So both the avoidance of glorification of Japan and the avoidance of Han within the film's form of construction explain the absence of objectives in the Bastards as a these explanations both originate from the historical oppression created based on the Japanese occupation in the first half of the 20th century, through the avoidance and glorification of the country that suppressed the Korean culture and the former, and the embodiment of a cultural concept that originated through Korean oppression and Japanese and the latter. In both cases, the depiction of World War II in South Korean cinema stems from the historical occurrence of the Japanese occupation, which by extension can also explain the dearth of South Korean World War II films in totality. So as previously discussed, during World War II, Korea was fighting under Japanese coercion, and as a result, the war can be viewed as another action Japan forced upon Korea during the occupation. Therefore, World War II can be placed alongside Japan's other attempts to overturn the Korean culture, such as the suppression of the Korean language, the forced adoption of Japanese names, or the dilution of Korean education, and not as a separate conflict. Consequently, while there are at least a dozen films produced by South Korea that set during the 1939 to 1945 period, most use this era as a backdrop to the depictions of the Korean populace suffering under the oppression of Japan on Korean soil, or of the Korean resistance movements fighting the Japanese on Korean streets. Rather, films that directly engage with Korea's historic and social cultural climate during World War II through depictions of conscription and sexual slavery are in the minority. Therefore, the majority of South Korean films that are set during World War II are in fact films that depict the Japanese occupation and the conflicts they are in, and do not explore the grand geopolitical conflict of World War II. As a result, the lack of South Korean World War II films is due to those that are set during this era actually depicting the Japanese occupation. For a South Korean film to be considered as a depiction of World War II and not the Japanese occupation, the narrative has to be separated from the pictures of the Korean oppression on the peninsula and instead focus upon Korea's social cultural climate in the context of the war, specifically through the portrayal of forced conscription or sexual slavery of Korean citizens. So the South Korean historical film is inherent with the depictions of geopolitical conflicts, yet World War II remains largely unrepresented within the historical cinema of this nation. Until the South Korean historical film treats World War II as a separate conflict, the war will remain overlooked in South Korean cinema for the foreseeable future. Rendering the victims of the Nigerian Civil War. Thank you for all being here today. Um, 
of Dextrous' 2005 monotype Memory Moonlight Play is a collage-like work of abstracted swaths of bright reds, greens, intersecting white linear forms, while a dark and distorted, dejected face in the top register creates a harsh contrast. One of the artist's more recent works, it evokes a sense of melancholic memorialization through coloration, as its title implies. The reverberations of a traumatic past are evident in Udechifu's more contemporary works due both to the deep impact of the Nigerian civil war on his practice and contemporary political crises, which remind the artist of his own experiences. The independent state of Biafra declared sovereignty on May 30, 1967, in response to the extreme persecution suffered by the Igbo people, one of the three major ethnic groups in Nigeria. Igbo author Chinua Achebe describes, and I quote, as we fled home to eastern Nigeria to escape all manner of atrocities that were being inflicted upon us and our families in different parts of Nigeria, we saw ourselves as victims. Udejiku and Igbo himself had to flee and became a displaced person due to the conflict. Despite the Nigerian government's denial of the Igbo's persecution, Udechiku and Achebe argue that the Igbo were victims of a long process of systematic exclusion and discrimination. When the conflict ended with Biafra's surrender in 1970, the Northern Nigerian Army leader, General Yakubu Gowan, infamously stated that there was no victor, no vanquished, despite the heavy destruction and loss of life. The images that media outlets circulated around the globe throughout the conflict seemed to negate Goan's claim. The Nigerian Civil War was the first televised African conflict, which invaded the average Westerner's living room. Curator and critic Okui Nwezor highlights how the photographic imaginary of Africa exists between paradoxical fields of representation. Western photographers either picture African subjects as at-risk, suffering bodies, or romanticize the continent's natural beauty. The photographic and filmic footage of starving Biafran children which circulated through the media participated in this singular reductive narrative about the continent as an isolated, dark, and violent place. That being said, and Wazor concedes that there are, of course, reasons to examine representations of Africa other than the wish to create positive stories and perspectives. African individuals such as Udejiku have lived through trauma, upheaval, and violence, and that pain should not be ignored. In Wazor, though, calls for an ethical commitment to considering representations of Africa. To engage in such an ethical consideration, one must recognize the nuances of particular contexts and consider each situation as part of the larger world, not isolated to the continent. And in so doing, avoid this singular analysis and representation of the continent at large. In this spirit, I want us to consider how Udechiku put pen to paper to capture the everyday trauma of the conflict as a displaced person in Biafra, at the same time as the rest of the world was being presented with these images. Udechiku produced over 50 sketchbooks featuring drawings of the violence enacted upon the Igbo. Miraculously, these drawings survived the war fairly intact, and recently art historian Chika Okeke Agulu has published a monograph on these sketchbooks. He argues that Udechiku's defining practice is his drawing. However, his graphic record of the war inspired his realization of a choice number of paintings. Since these paintings are inspired by an amalgamation of his sketches, they cannot be considered literal depictions of specific moments or individuals, but rather are representations of the artist's own psychical engagement with his lived everyday trauma during the conflict. My presentation today therefore focuses on three of these understudied semi-abstract paintings by Udechiku, created during the conflict. Silent faces at a crossroads, blue figures, refugees, and the only sun. I argue that Udechiku puts primacy on the abstractly colorful and thus emotive rendering of the Igbo victims of the Biafran Civil War in these works due to the humanitarian urgency of the Nigerian government's denial of the Igbo their status as victims. In contrast to the journalistic images widely circulated of Biafran victims, Udechiku's paintings depict Igbo individuals from the position of a fellow Igbo, establishing a sense of agency and emotion absent from the infamous media images of the conflict. Importantly, Udechiku's paintings are psychologically mediated, relaying his personal trauma in response to the conflict, and in this way they position their spectator as a witness to his perennial suffering. 
they go beyond the meta representation of war by requiring us ethically to address this history of injustice. And I'll return to that later. Before I trace Redemption's story and the post-colonial context that led to the cessation of Biafra, I begin with a small concession. My primary, though certainly not only, historical source uh, for this paper is Chinua Achebe's 2012 book, There Was a Country, A Personal History of Biafra. And this is because he unapologetically outlines what he calls the Nigerian government's detailed plan of mass killing of the Igbo. It's important to note that this perspective remains controversial and implicated in politics to this day. There are historians who argue that there never was an attempted Igbo genocide and the war has never been globally recognized as such. Since my paper is concerned with Udechiku's perspective and his paintings, and the artist himself uh, fervently believes there was an attempted genocide, and I was able to spend time with him in the fall of 2016, uh, I interviewed him. He lives in upstate New York now, very far upstate. Um, I chose to utilize Achebe's book as a primary source for this reason. Biafra's modern history began with the West African territory, the British colonial enterprise named Nigeria following the Berlin Conference of 1885. This territory was one of the most densely and diversely populated with over 250 different ethnic groups. These various groups were held together by an arbitrary border assignment and a new unfamiliar form of indirect rule by the British, and thus were lumped together as one nation without any consideration of their historical or cultural differences. This laid a backdrop for chronic divisiveness within Nigeria, and this was enhanced by the British government's treatment of the North and South as split administrative regions. In the years leading up to Nigerian independence, the disputes between these factions intensified. When Nigeria gained its official independence in 1960, the British government focused on bolstering its continued financial and commercial control rather than attempting to pacify any divisiveness they had exacerbated. In order to ensure their continued role in a post-independence Nigeria, the government chose Sir James Robertson, who had previously been posted in the Sudan, to rig the first Nigerian national election, so that a Hausa Fulani northerner, Abu Bakar Tafawa Balewa, would become Nigeria's first prime minister. The six years after Nigeria gained its official independence were fraught with corruption, as the politicians in place were pawns of foreign business interests. On January 15, 1966, Political turmoil in Nigeria came to a head when a military coup d'etat resulted in the control of the country being placed in the hands of an Igbo, Major Chukwuma Nzegogu. The coup was viewed as a sinister plot by the Igbo to take control of Nigeria. Achebe and Udechiku both argue that this perception gained widespread acceptance due to decades of resentment towards the Igbo. Moreover, Nzegogu made General Johnson Agui Iransi the new prime minister, who was also Igbo. This coup inspired many brutal massacres of the Igbo throughout Nigeria. Thousands of civilian men, women, and children were murdered or wounded, their homes and lives destroyed. A Sierra Leonean individual who lived in northern Nigeria wrote at the time, and I quote, the killing of the Igbo has become a state industry in Nigeria. Following the coup, there ensued a counter-coup led by northern military officers in July of 1966, during which all the Igbo leaders were murdered. This coup only emboldened military officers throughout Nigeria to continue persecuting Igbo. Lieutenant General Dumegu Ojuku, who is the leader of the southern and predominantly Igbo region, he's pictured on the slide, declared sovereignty for the independent Republic of Biafra from Nigeria in May of 1967, asserting that the Igbo needed independence in order to survive. In June, the Nigerian army led by Northerner General Yakubu Gowan responded with a full armed assault against Biafra, which began the Nigerian Civil War. In 1967, when the war began, Udechiku was only 20 years old and a sophomore at the premier art school at the University of Nsuka. Nsuka is located in the eastern region of Nigeria and thus was on the northern border of Biafra. When the Nigerian military advanced into Biafra, those residing at the university, including Udechiku, fled east to escape the army's aggression. As each town fell to the Nigerian army, Udechiku fled deeper east, first back to his family in the village of Agulu, later becoming a displaced person and refugee for the remainder of the 30-month conflict. While he conceived that his situation was better than most, he lived through and witnessed the aftermath of air raids, pogroms, and intense starvation. He painted silent faces at a crossroads at the beginning of the war in 1967. And the work really focuses on the mass flight of the Igbo as the Northern Nigerian army invaded Biafra. 
And what I focus on in the paper and I go into too much detail about today um, is that the semi-abstract qualities of this work function concurrently to illustrate the frustration of ethnic-based prejudice, but also uh, to celebrate ego resilience. While human bodies are legible in the crowd, their scale and specific mimetic details are ambiguous. Bright colored paint seems to drip into the figure's faces, hindering any ability to clarify facial specificities. Udechiku highlights the top of the heads of all the figures in the front row with bright hues of green, yellow, blue, and white, creating a certain uniformity of the crowd. Because no individual can be identified due to this abstracted rendering, they become simply one of an indistinguishable group. This aesthetic unity can be related to traditional Igbo societal construction, where they organize their social groups first basically on clan. This ensured that they all maintained mutual responsibility for each individual, and this was used to their advantage in the migratory units that the Igbo formed when they fled east. To their advantage because it offered social protection for all individuals. While the narrative of the experience of forced migration is paramount in this work, many portions of the composition are devoted to fields of colorful paint. Udechiku explains that while he prefers the medium of drawing, painting adds another dimension through color. The artist imbues his paintings with a visceral expressive force through both color and the distortion of the figures in order to represent his emotion that's behind their production. In Silent Faces, the use of color such as the deep patch of red in the middle register at the left of the canvas serves no mimetic function, but rather can be interpreted as symbolic of blood and violence more largely. His desire to use color in his expressive style is part of a more complex aspect of his artistic practice, which can be explained by his work as a propagandist. In February of 1968, Udechiku received an invitation to join the visual unit of the Directorate of Propaganda. The Biafran Ministry of Information organized this propaganda effort in order to galvanize the Biafran citizens, many of whom were fighting for their newly formed country despite the extreme violence they were enduring at the hands of the Nigerian army. Historians have actually asserted that the Biafran government's employment of propaganda sustained the war effort for the full three years. For the propaganda unit, Udechiku designed posters, magazine layouts, and cartoons. And while his private artistic style, such as the paintings I'm looking at, differed from that of the propaganda he created, they still engage with the intersection of art and politics. Here we can see a page from one of his personal sketchbooks, in which he was working through poster designs to inspire patriotism in his fellow Biafran. Unfortunately, the library of the Directorate of Propaganda was destroyed when the Nigerian government regained control of the African territory, making it impossible to view concrete examples of his propaganda work. Udechiku really holds the conviction that the best artist can reach everyone, and he really wanted to move people, I think, in the same way that Professor Burke was talking about earlier. And in this way, his work has been called instrumentalist. I think the term instrumental is quite complicated and in the context of psychoanalytic trauma theory is really wrong with negative associations. Um, in this context, he tries to imbue it with positivity. Um, his paintings are not intended as propaganda, but he's, he is creating work with the intention of it being used, as I said, to really move people in order to critique the inhumanity of the Northern Nigerian Army's treatment of the Afrins and inspire his fellow Igbo to continue to fight for their sovereignty. Since the artist recognizes his works as psychologically mediated and involved with his own emotional processing, he conceives that they represent his subjective perspective alone, which I think also complicates the view of his work as instrumentalist in a negative way. His other works, Blue Figures, Refugees, and Only Sun, were both painted in 1968 when he was working for the Biafran Propaganda Unit. This work alludes to the fact that one of the major tactics of the Nigerian army was to deny the Biafrans access to food. By the end of the conflict, close to one million Igbo, mostly children, died of starvation. In reference to the extremity of the starvation, the bodies in the painting are zoomed in on, such that the frame of the canvas cuts off their limbs. The effect of this close viewing is an enhanced awareness of their bodies' emaciation and distortion. The larger figure on the left spans the entire canvas, and their bones jut out partially. The ribs are visible, as is the distended stomach. Not only does the side of the canvas cut off the figure's right hand, but also the left arm is cut off right below the elbow. The viewer may presume that the arm is lost due to the violence of the conflict. Metaphorically, however, you can also think about this severed limb as an allusion to feelings of castration amongst the Igbo incited by the conflict more generally. In the only sun, the deep purples and blacks of the background contrast sharply with the yellowish green hue of the mother's body. 
enhancing her emaciated figure, which Ujechiku is dramatically depicted in sharp geometric shapes. The arms, back, and stomach push out into the background from all sides, emphasizing the breakdown of her physical form. In particular, her breasts, the only indicator of her biological sex, hang from her skeletal body, strangely robust despite her clearly stark state. The breasts hang pointedly down towards the limp body of the child as if to emphasize for the viewer the deep pain of the loss of the mother's only son, a pain that derives from a primal state of motherhood, in which I refer to the body state where the lactating mother feels pain when the child cannot relieve the milk from her breasts. However, the painting's title emphasizes the status of this child as the grieving mother's only son, highlighting not only the body pain of motherhood, but also the emotional pain accompanying the hopeless future following the death of the child. The inclusion of facial details enhances the viewer's awareness of the child's youth. His leg and forehead are cut off by the canvas, as are his mother's hands. We can read this splicing again as part of the artist's continued evocation of feelings of castration and hopelessness. The extension of the victim's limbs beyond the border of the canvas is a reoccurring feature in Dutch Goose paintings of Biafra. As the various victims' bodies seem to continue beyond the frame, we are reminded of the suffering that occurred in reality beyond the realm of the aesthetic in which we now encounter it. Despite international recognition for the Biafran plea for independence as a humanitarian cause, overwhelmingly within Nigeria, the Biafrans were viewed as armed enemies rather than victims of long-known persecution. After the surrender of Biafra, those Igbo who had fled east hoping for a government who would recognize the persecution they had endured, their inherent human dignity and need for safety had to call themselves Nigerians once again. General Gowan's declaration that there was no victor and no vanquished cemented the repression of this event throughout the country, entirely ignoring those who were indeed vanquished during the conflict. Achebe describes the post-war sentiments of the Igbo as such, and I quote, Nigeria had not succeeded in crushing the spirit of the Igbo people, but it had left us indignant, stripped bare, and stranded in the wilderness. In recent years, Igbo youth have developed a passionate interest in the symbol and history of Biafra. Here you can see there are multiple contemporary associations devoted to Igbo independence and a future secessionist Biafra. However, protesters for Igbo rights and sovereignty are often violently attacked by Nigerian military officials and many are jailed. Through their colorful, expressionistic, and semi-abstract style, Ujechiku's paintings renewed the Igbo with the agency accompanying the truth of their victimhood during this still repressed history. Moreover, the fact that his paintings are physical representations of a survivor's psychological suffering conditions a specific viewing experience. And in the longer version of this paper, I sort of theoretically address that type of spectator experience. Since the artist's psychic wounds call to the viewer from each painting, that viewer is both emotionally affected as well as morally implicated. To bear witness to the perennial psychic suffering of another is a deeply important act. The viewing of these paintings, and perhaps paintings by survivors of historic trauma and conflict more broadly, has a deeper level of influence on the viewing subject. We are not looking at something separate from us in distance, but rather we are brought into the realm of the moral, asked to bear witness, and therefore ethically implicated in this history. Um, but the background is not realistic. 
the colors are not realistic, um, things are distorted. And so I look at them together to think about what the spectator experience is like. And I think in an embodied context of thinking about how you relate to semi-abstraction, um, semi-abstract depictions of bodies in pain, bodies um, distorted and suffering. So that's sort of the context of his, of what I'm looking at his work. So this is a chapter from like a 60 page larger thesis. So both guys are right in the same historical period. Yeah. Like yeah. 60s, no. yeah, 60s and 70s. Yeah. What do you make of their choice of aesthetics? The fact that they both use body roles and the abstraction. Yeah, I think um, part of it is this anxiety not to lose narrative. So I think both of them would be uncomfortable with complete abstraction. Um, I think maybe abstraction could still serve some purpose of working through their traumatic experiences, but the the importance of the historical specificity, I think, especially in Obiora's work. Um, would be lost in complete abstraction. I think that's sort of how he would describe it. Um, but I think there's also something about, something more affective in there being a bodily component. So the spectator is still sort of aware of your own vulnerability as a human body in, in the face of these images. Um, but then you're also getting something more visceral and expressive through the color. So it's sort of that combination uh, that I think, I'm not sure, I don't think either of them would say that that's why they did it, um, but I think for them it was more of a post-trauma expressive experience that resulted in these paintings. For Obiora, it was in the moment, but Marianne worked um, after, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, of his Holocaust experience. So. I mean, it's interesting that they're moving in this direction in this period because in parallel you have um, continental Europe primarily, of course, but also the states. You have a move towards abstraction in monumental um, sort of projects um, commissioned by the states. So commemoration of things like the Holocaust, like genocide, World War II, went from figurative towards abstraction. Yeah. It seems like this is going kind of in the other way. Yeah, I mean, if you think about something like Ad Reinhardt's like black paintings during the World War II that were just complete black painted squares. I think neither of these artists would feel that that would be adequate in recalling their experiences because I think, especially for Obiora, I think he really feels that this history is, is marginalized and, and repressed and um, it, is, it is true to, to a certain extent. Um, and so I think there would just be too much anxiety for both of them in going to complete monumental abstraction. I think um, historical specificity and narrative is too important um, for their work to do that. Even though I think, and I think actually because they did this, they don't fit into any sort of art historical canon or narrative. I mean, both of them become sort of essentialized, so you'll only see Udechiku's works in like African art museums, and you'll only see Marianne in Jewish museums. So you won't, you won't see either of them being contextualized within Western art history or abstraction or they just don't fit into the narrative that's been constructed by institutions like I, where I work, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, I mean, those, they don't fit into those narratives. So they might be collected by some of those institutions, but they're almost never shown. Like neither of them has been shown in any major exhibition ever. Another question? I'm really interested in your analysis, very detailed analysis of the films. Um, so it's an area completely outside my area of expertise. But are there films from the Korean War that, that you can sort of contrast this sort of experience of Han or Han through the imagery and, and a, a shift in the way the, relate, the relational thing is, is, is dealt with? Yeah, it's actually funny you bring up the Korean War because the director of My Way actually did a Korean War film. I believe it's called Tegaki or Brotherhood is an English language title. And yeah, it's essentially pretty much a very similar way in the dynamic between Jenshin and Tatsuo and My Way. It's pretty much a very this embodiment of both sides of the Korean War in that film. So the South and the North in Tegaki have basically, they're more or less conjoined. So they get up, they're basically very humanized in that sense that they're not oppositional and the true enemy of them is actually their government, for instance. And um, part of my actual doctoral thesis was to identify a cinematic aesthetic that was called Cinematica, that I identified. And that is essentially looking at films through what was that, early 1950s up until uh, 2015, I believe, seeing how it does manifest through all the films 
historical films of South Korea and through the Japanese occupation of World War II and the Korean War. And basically how that all influences these films to have a certain portrayal of Korea. So essentially they're always oppressed, they're always like looking as if the peninsula itself is something like prison. So in that regard that Han is at the heart of the historical representation of well, geopolitical conflict that no matter what no, time period actually is set in. So 1980s, 1990s, way back into like 500 AD with the Goryeo dynasty, uh, 1700s with the Joseon dynasty. Every time they depict their history in some form of geopolitical conflict, with like either swords or guns and that, but also with that central aesthetic of it. So no matter what they represent, it is always some, in some way present. Yeah, I hope that yeah, answers your questions. And we may have time for one more question. Yes. Um, anyway, Dave, I really enjoyed your paper. I'm just curious, I'm not sure if I quite got the timeline right, but who would the audience of those paintings have been as opposed to these? Yeah. The yeah. Style of work? I mean, they're quite sizable works. So yeah. Sure so, so most of them right now are in a storage unit at Mitsuka um, in Nigeria still. And, yeah. I'm, and I think his drawings are exhibited quite heavily um, in a gallery in New York that represents him um, and have been at the Smithsonian Museum of um, African Art and in other, I think, other spaces internationally. But these paintings have not really been on view anywhere other than in Suka. And so I think audience is an interesting question for his work because part of his work, an artist like him, I think, within the context of this conference, he's really just putting his own processing on canvas. Um, but there is something different about producing paintings versus like diary-like drawings like some of the ones that I showed. Um, and I think he, I, I asked him this question, who he sort of intended these works for, and he, he sort of said he, he doesn't have, he never thought about it, like the audience was not. It was, I think, more about excising the, this pain onto the canvas for him, like a sort of more psychological experience is how he described it. Um, I wish the audience was everybody. I mean, I obviously think his work is um, really fascinating and interesting, and um, as I said, you just don't really see his work. You can't really see his work anywhere. Um, I don't know what the right, maybe the Australian War Memorial, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think um, I think he sees his work as speaking universally. Well, when I met with him, he referenced Syria a lot. He's really, he's pained by the fact that these contemporary conflicts remind him of his own experiences. And I think in that way, he would like every, everyone in the world to see his work or others who had type of trauma that he had, um, but I think I think he wasn't thinking about it when he initially created the works. Do you need to carry all six of these paintings through a period of displacement no. before they know? Yeah, so they just got stuck essentially on Itsuka and when he left, and I think at least one of them, Blue Figures Refugees, was destroyed, um, but the other two are still in the storage unit. He, he's, he just went back to Nigeria. He, he um, has a complicated relationship with the Nigerian government. Um, so he moved, he immigrated to the US and then was teaching at St. Lawrence University as an art professor for, I think, 30 years. And now he's finally retired and going back to Nigeria and we'll, maybe he'll do something that he takes as a result. Um, that would be great. But he didn't carry them with, he only carried the notebooks and drawings. I actually misread that. We have like 10 more minutes. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, let's thank our two presenters, and then if you want to carry on talking to them, I'm sure they're okay with it.